Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Perspective Philosophy. I am joined here today with Kane B from his own YouTube channel, and uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, Kane. Uh, I'm not really very good at introductions, so I, uh, I'm a philosophy PhD student uh, coming towards the end of my PhD now, and yeah, I run a YouTube channel, uh, mainly focusing on uh, introductory lectures on philosophy, but there are other bits and pieces on there as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Uh, no, no, that's okay. I think you did a good job. So yeah, he's a he's a PhD student coming to his coming to the end of his PhD, and uh, he made a video on uh, why he doesn't care about animals. And so at first, I watched the video. I thought you were a uh, contractarian. Apparently, absolutely wrong. Um, Not absolutely wrong. That 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 would be unreasonable because I definitely gave that impression in in that video. Um, so that that was a re that was a reasonable assumption to make. <clears throat> well, it seemed that you, when you described it, you were saying like it is the reason that we care about others is essentially in order to govern and uh, to govern our wants to lead us to um, essentially conclusions that we would like, you know, most appreciate. So. Like uh, an example would be, um, you know, I think you give the example of what everyone you wanted to walk on the grass, but knowing that the grass would be destroyed if everyone walked on it, you knew it was in your rational self-interest to impede the the uh, to impede the the freedom of everyone in order to maintain your uh, desires or the ability to actualize your desires. And um, you said that it, the only reason it would be universalized, though, like you know, the reason that the rule would apply to everyone, but not and not just you because ideally you walk on the grass whenever you want uh everyone else gets to walk on the path and never on the grass the grass is now canes um but unfortunately people will see that as unfair rebel against the rule and then not participate so universalization is the only um course of action for you in the term of uh pragmatics it seems rather than rather than anything else is that is that is that about right um, that's, I, I mean, that's certainly the uh, perspective I adopted in that particular video. Um, yeah, so it's yeah. Uh, moral rules are uh, constructed by rational agents acting basically in self-interest. Um, they're constructed by rational agents for rational agents um, because we all recognise, um, at least you know, if we're if we're sensible, we all recognise that by by agreeing to follow particular rules which limit our behaviour. Um, we can make if we like if we all if all individuals do that then we can make all of us better off um and so i i definitely i mean share that kind of contractarian like intuition um i think that's a it's a useful perspective that we can take on uh, moral problems um so when i so the reason why i say i'm not a contractarian um is my general view of morality i mean i'm i'm very much on the anti-realist side and yeah you were saying that just before so we started you're like i'm actually a I, hardcore shall I explain for the uh, for the viewers uh, absolutely okay. absolutely so yeah I, i'm an anti-realist now what a lot of anti-realists will do is they will despite being anti-realist they will kind of continue engaging in a sort of realist type project now, I actually don't really have a problem with them doing this. From what we discussed, it sounded like you had more of a problem with that than, than I do. Um, but a lot of anti-realists, they will continue trying to uh, arrive at a coherent, consistent moral system that they can just apply universally. Um, and uh, a lot of them will try to show that we can, uh, I think as a quasi-realist might put it, like earn the right to talk as if there are moral facts. Um, so we proceed when we're doing like normative ethics and applied ethics, we just kind of ignore the fact that we're anti-realists and we proceed as if there are moral facts. Um, and so somebody from who takes that kind of perspective, um, yeah, they, they may well uh, find themselves attracted to contractarianism and they might say, well, I am a contractarian and this is the kind of, this is the point of view that I'm going to apply whenever I encounter any moral problem or I, ha I have to engage in moral reasoning, like this is the way to do it. This is the best way to do it. Um, I don't really see things that way. I just see morality as being a kind of tool of persuasion. Um, it's something I can, I can use, uh, to persuade people to act in ways that I want them to. Um, I, 
I think that that, that kind of so, so what, the way I see it is there's various different perspectives that I can take on moral problems. I can adopt a sort of contractarian type line and uh, uh, that can be useful in certain contexts. When it comes to something like animals, um, that was useful because I think everybody sort of, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people get the sort of contractarian intuitions, right? The idea that morality is something that we construct uh, for the purposes of maximizing our self-interest makes sense to a lot of people, especially if you think about morality from like an evolutionary point of view or something like that. If you ask, okay, why did this practice emerge? That kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, and so, you know, that, that perspective is independently motivated and it gives you a very, very easy way to get to the conclusion that animals don't matter. Um, but I'm perfectly happy to adopt other you know, perspectives on it, uh, other type, other ways of engaging in moral reasoning. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to just like uh, construct a moral system on the basis of my intuitions about particular cases, for instance. Um, and it so happens that in my case, uh, appealing to moral intuitions will get me the same result with respect to animals as the more kind of contractarian approach, because I just don't care about animals. Um, I don't like if I see an animal suffering, it, it, I don't have the intuition that there's anything like bad there um, or that there's anything that I like ought to stop. Um, it just doesn't bother me. So if if I'm appealing to my moral intuitions, I'll get the same the same result. But obviously that's not going to be very persuasive to anyone else because most people don't have that kind of uh, uh, psychological, uh, those kinds of psychological reactions. Um, so, you know, I, I, but like, I obviously, yeah, but if you're a moral anti realist, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like the whole point is, I mean, the thing is as well, like, um, with, um, it seems to be like a, you're like a hardline prescriptivist, um, like a hardline prescriptivist. Am I, am I, I right? Like kind of, uh, I mean, um, okay. because it seems like, um, I, I, I would say that it, I'm, it, I'm just it, an error theorist these days. Um, I, I tried to be a non moral theorist for quite a while, but. Error theory is just easier. Mm. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you, you, you say error theorist, but then you said it's a tool for prescription uh, in order to get what you want. Persuasion. Um, persuasion. Sorry, my bad. Uh, but similar, like obviously, persuasion being a form of um, basically, it, it, I guess, rather than um, uh, I would say that you're trying to um, you know place your desires upon another individual, like. Um, Kind of like, and I think it it fits the the prescriptivist kind of framework. You know, um, I I don't like X, uh, and you shouldn't like X either. You know, um, like or like uh, just essentially is just trying to abide by uh, your will. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be prescriptivist, but um, it seems obviously as as you say, like uh, yeah, I guess like um, funnily enough, funnily enough, almost uh, in line with the sophistic tradition. You know, the rhetorician. Um, kind of like framework of of, of uh, back in back in ancient Greece, like uh, you know, Calices, you know, uh, it's a, like you probably see morality. Like, so they they understood morality to be obviously a pure a, t a tool of pure persuasion as well. Um, and you know, that's um, I mean, it's not fine. I'm actually going to argue against that, of course. Like, obviously, the whole my my not only would everything I say be entirely um, arguably meaningless. I mean, p pointless at least. Um, but you know, uh, what I want to know, I guess, from all of this is, um, why you're an anti-realist in like, um, in terms of like, so you're an error theorist. I think that, that you said that there. So you're saying that there's a metaphysical separation between, let's say, um, ethics and morality, uh, versus let's say, you know, like, like, like other, uh, epistemological fields. Yeah. Um, so you, when you say ethics and morality, you, you mean ethics and morality is one thing versus the other epistemological fields so, yeah sorry, i just mean um, like the epistemics of like so for um so, so you're not I, I, I sorry i, I was just a bit confusing because i mean were you using the term ethics and morality to refer to different things um then or well i, I would use them to, right. uh, to as different things typically so i'd say like ethics is um uh you know the pertaining to behavior like ethicos yeah and uh, i would say morality is the study of what is like you know good good and uh, like Morality is good and bad. Ethics is right and wrong. Um, if if that makes it easier. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, um, just to clarify, uh, I I don't 
identify I, I used to be a non-cognitivist um i i'm kind of moving away from that now um i'm at the end of the day i i don't really care uh, what we say about like the meaning of moral statements at least not in the sort of technical way that a lot of meta-ethicists deal with that problem. I mean, obviously, the meaning of moral statements matters to some extent, because otherwise we wouldn't know what we were talking about, right? But um, when it comes to the debates about whether or not they are you know, merely expressions of attitudes or commands, or whether moral statements are like attempting to describe you know, features of the world, um, I'm, I, I don't know if it's that important to me. I'm... It, I, I'm in, I'm attracted to error theory because honestly that it seems to me that yeah like people probably are just using moral statements uh, to you know attribute properties to particular actions um, they're, they're probably using them in a way that they take to be evaluable as truth true or false um, and when I say that it's a tool of persuasion I mean it's like look I see morality as basically a fiction and I can engage in that. I can I can do that, right? I can tell those stories with a goal of persuading people. I mean, it's kind of like how I I, I could, I suppose, uh, uh, let's say, be an atheist who decides to engage in religious discourse in order to persuade people to act in particular ways, right? Like that's totally possible. Um, so I guess it's a similar sort of thing here. So. You know, just just to clarify my position there, I, I I'd be inclined to call myself an error theorist, uh, but I also I don't really care. Um, yeah, I I mean like questions about the, the the sort of ontology of moral value are the interesting questions. Questions about how exactly people are using moral statements is that's maybe less interesting. But that's just me. Well, I, I think um, like in terms of like obviously. Um... Obviously, the error theory is in relation to uh, epistem like well, it's an epistemic and somewhat metaphysically barren argument. So obviously, um, like when we talk about like the argument, like um, like in terms of Mackey when he talks about like queerness, the the queerness of um, you know moral um, like moral statements. It seems to me that he's he he's pointing out one like the multiplicity of of goods that people refer to, like something is good and. Um, it almost seems to be somewhat related to the open-ended argument in in terms of Moore, but also to say that there is an epistemological problem as in terms of like there's there's no truth maker that can be you know attributed to um, like you know whether something is good or not. Mm. So then you can't go well like this the you know uh, you know X is good or X is right uh, against something that would allow you to verify or falsify that statement, and and that's really like the kind of the bones of the argument. Would you agree? Um. So I, I'm inclined, so I don't know if I see like error theory is dependent on any specific argument. I mean, so certainly like queerness argument is an important one, but I mean, as I understand it, it's like error theory literally is just the view that, okay, moral claims have truth value, but they're just all false. Um, like, I think that's basically like that's it right as long whatever argument you use to get to that position if you're in, if you've got that position then then you're an error theorist you know? what argue do you use argument do you use oh um, yeah so um oh man that's that's a big question um okay i uh all right so first of all i think that the idea of knockdown arguments in philosophy is kind of ridiculous right so when you ask me what argument do i use well I mean, there isn't going to be just just one argument. It's more like there are a whole bunch of different considerations which all like push me in that direction. Um, so I think okay. first first thing. We'll them one by one. Well, yeah, okay then. Let me. I'll, I'll try to be quick on this. Um, so uh, first thing is um, maybe maybe I should just sort of go back. So before, it's like before I got into philosophy, even before I did philosophy, right? It just seemed to me right that m moral claims um were like either just false or the sort of things that couldn't be true or false it seemed intuitively obvious to me that when people were making moral claims they were doing something more like uh you know they were saying things that were more analogous to uh chocolate cake is tasty uh, than they were to saying something like you know mount everest is the tallest mountain on earth right it, it just seemed to me like moral claims were something more like expressions of emotion or expressions of attitude than they were 
uh, like descriptions of facts. Um, and so I'm again going back to before I did any kind of philosophy. That was just my the, the sort of position that I just held naturally, right? So that was intuition. yeah, my intuition. And you know, whenever you uh, engage in any kind of philosophical argument, I think you know you sort of you got to start somewhere, um, and that's the kind of place where I started from. Um, I'm, I find, uh, part of the reason why this is difficult is because, like, obviously the objection, any objection I have to a more realist position is going to depend on the details of that position, right? Like, and there are, you know, there are different kinds of realism. Um, so it's, it's difficult to, to give, like, a general, uh, reason, but... I can say, yeah, I, I, I think I find like certain forms of the queerness argument quite persuasive, um, certain forms of the like evolutionary debunking argument um, that, you know, the, the, and similar problems of like epistemic access. If there were like moral facts, it doesn't seem like um, the means that we have for coming to moral conclusions could possibly be uh, truth tracking. They could possibly track the moral truth. Um, I think that I, I actually think there's a, a problem which hasn't really been, I don't know if this argument has really been put forward in the literature, um, but it seems to me that uh, when I look at like morality on a purely first order level, I think that it might just be incoherent. Um, and uh, so I just, uh, it was very recently I, I read this article by um, Thomas Nagel, it was called War and Massacre, and there was this line in it where he talked about uh, how, you know, people have these like two different ways of approaching morality and maybe there are more than two but he was just talking about these two you know deontological and consequentialist and it, it, he talked about how these generate um kind of moral dilemmas how they seem to be in tension and there's this line in there where he says um i mean i can't remember it exactly but basically what he, he expressed in that line was that um yes we hope that there's a way of making these like fit together but we have to face the pessimistic conclusion that maybe he um, maybe the tension is just irresolvable, right? Maybe there is no coherent moral system we can construct out of these. And so I, uh, like, and that just sort of struck me because I sort of thought, yeah, um, there's a, I, I guess I, I'm inclined to think that, like, maybe these two different ways of thinking about morality, these two different things that generate moral intuitions, like the, the, the deontological approach and the consequentialist approach, these seem to be like deep and fundamental features of our moral reasoning and they seem to be in tension and like maybe we should <laughs> maybe we should just accept uh the way things seem there right maybe they they are um and in which case it looks like morality as a kind of project is just incoherent um so if if you accept that there are sort of two ways of approaching morality that are uh fundamental to it uh that are sort of ineliminable like we can't get you know, we, we can't um, kind of get rid of one of them um, and they are genuinely in tension, they, they genuinely can't be made coherent, then you have a sort of first order incoherence. Um, also, moral beliefs just, uh, I, I guess they seem to be um, unlike other beliefs insofar as there's, it's, it's, it seems to be much more reasonable to be like intransigent um, in the face of moral disagreement and just to like uh, retain one's perspective even in the face of completely different points of view. Um, it seems to be reasonable to uh, like ignore moral experts in a way that wouldn't be reasonable um, in other fields. Um, and so there's all of these things kind of push me towards an anti realist position. But I do want to say, I, I don't think that that there's anything irrational about being a moral realist or anything like that and I mean at least part of the reason why I accept moral anti-realism is because I you know I have other commitments elsewhere in philosophy that you know make that make that plausible um you know certainly for anyone who's not as much of a hardcore empiricist as I am um I think that you know you should be a lot more open to the possibility that moral realism would be correct um so I, I i don't know does that answer your question i feel like that was a that was a big ramble and i'm not so, sure that made so any real yeah. sense uh, no 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 i think so so um what i kind of got from that was um intuitionally you kind of fell on the side of boo hurrah anyway um like emotivism 
and then um and then um then you said like you you have issues with like truth tracking in terms of um, moral propositions and then um you um obviously you mentioned <clears throat> you're an empiricist which we'll probably have to get onto at, at some point actually because that like obviously my metaphysical commitments is really i think one of the reasons why um i would argue for for realism because i um <clears throat> i'm <laughs> I'm uh, I'm certainly not an empiricist. I'm 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 an idealist. So it's uh, I mean literally the opposite side, pretty much. I mean, I'm, <laughs> so I'm, happy grant, I'm happy to grant idealists into the empiricist fold. I think Barclay was, uh, you know, empiricist. So uh, <laughs> that's, see, uh, see, I, I would say that uh, I, I would um, was it uh, you know um, have you come across Seller's argument against empiricism? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I was convinced by that, if I'm honest, and then uh, yeah, I, I I'm, a, also... I'm an empiricist of a slightly uh, do I want to say more sophisticated? Maybe that would be a little bit um, presumptuous. I'm an empiricist of a slightly different kind. Um, so I uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> okay, right. Well, this is okay. We're just going to debate entirely Western philosophy. It's okay. Um, I'm just trying to think where to start. Um, Okay, I'm I'm really sorry about this because I feel like that was a terrible answer. Um, like the, the the answer I gave as to like why I'm an anti-realist. No, it's I, not I terrible. Genuinely, oh, no, like, no. I don't know. So I think the, that is the only answer. I think it's a fair answer. The, pro in one the problem respect, is, is because that in I both cases, that... it's like you're just both of us are kind of weighing up lots of different considerations. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I apologize for so <laughs> what I'll do. Cause it seems like because I think you're right in one respect. I think an anti-realist is a negative position. Um, and I think that when you're looking at, you know, a rejection of a positive position, you need a positive position from which to reject. And so when I say, why are you a moral anti-realist? You're like, well, tell us the realism that I'm rejecting, you know, and, and like, and I kind of get that. Like, um, like, so for example, if I'm a, if I'm, if it, it's a very different position, if I start arguing for platonic realism and the form of the good versus like the Hegelian that I am, you know what I mean? So like, there is, there is a lot of considerations to, to go into that. And I think that you're absolutely right. And, and in, in terms of seeing anti-realism as, um, as, as the rejection of something rather than something in and of itself, um, because then obviously you'd be promoting, you know, let's say, as, as you say, like something like non-cognitivism. Um, and then I would hammer down on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, right, where to start? Um, I could outline where I think, what, like, what my moral theory is, like what my ethical theory is, and then you can tell me why you think it's wrong. If you think that's a... Well, you know what, it's, um, hey, it's, it's, it's your discussion, that sounds like a good place to go. Um, why why okay. don't we do that? <laughs> Okay, so um, being a good continental boy, um, I start everything from the position of, um, um, you know, like uh, what I would say is that in terms of dialectic, you know, what can be doubted? We'll start from a, like a, maybe a Cartesian-esque position um, and then say, where must I um, end? And I think that the, there's two things that can be assumed uh, or must be assumed. So... Um, I think Descartes leads us to the point in which we, you know, we can establish the idea of a thinking thing, and um, I do. I would reject Cogito Ergo Sum, though. I think he assumes self-consciousness, um, particularly in, term, in forms of um, um, like uh, what's it, um, psychological continuity. But uh, I do agree that there is some form of thinking um not necessarily personal so i think that would just end up with being really and then there is um and then there is reason the um the applicability of logic the laws of logic i think that like right. uh, I, I don't think that we're really getting through anything beyond that like I, I, you're not like um uh, you don't deny the laws of logic do you uh because if you do because that's where we're going to fight first <laughs> um I mean I, I think I probably do. Uh yeah. I um <laughs> So okay. So part of the I I mean it, it kind of depends on what you mean when you say the laws of logic, right? Because um 
the, the issue is that there are a whole bunch of different uh, logical systems, let's say, and um, it seems to me that, that these are... So, let's say the laws of logic are as much up for grabs as, uh, uh, like, empirical laws and so on. I mean, I, I guess I'm um, at least somewhat attracted to something like a kind of Quinean web of belief sort of take on this, where, actually, no, even the laws of logic can be revised. I also think that... Um, I would agree, one, one of to the, some degree, I think they could be. But just to also kind of... Yeah, so... One of the issues that I have with the idea of like the laws of logic is, so it looks like the, the, the point here is that there's going to be some sort of argument forms that, um, or types of inferences that are truth preserving uh, universally, right? Like, I mean, that's the idea. They're truth preserving in virtue of their form. Um, so, you know, whatever you kind of plug in to the like non-logical parts of the propositions, a priori. You get it? You you know you 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 know that that's going to preserve truth from premises to conclusion. Um, and I mean, I don't. I I'm not sure that there really are laws of logic in in that sense. I think that even you know, in the case of something like modus ponens, uh, there are exceptions to it, um, and those exceptions may well be generated by features of our language let's say um where which where one perspective you could take on this is to say well okay there's some sort of problem with our language um i mean this is kind of the view that russell and frager took actually right they recognized that um because of the way our language works right because of problems like vagueness uh, it turns out that uh, like these logical laws aren't really always applicable. And so their response to that is, oh, okay, right, language has a problem. We need to uh, construct a kind of ideal language. Um, but the other, the other way to look at it is to say, no, no, the, the, the language is fine. And maybe indeed these, you know, these so-called problems are, are ineliminable in principle. Um, and we should just acknowledge that um, the, you know, the laws of logic have limits, limits which we can... Um, you know, discover uh, by engaging in, in philosophy and perhaps also even science. Um, so I, 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 I don't know if, if like, how, how that sounds to you. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious talking about the laws of logic for those <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Art, um, very much. I mean, like, the laws of logic in terms of, like, the actual laws themselves, mm. I can see progressing. Uh, I'm a Hegelian. So I think that logic itself, the science of logic, the logic actually progresses with the content of the thought, right? So um, logic's actually an expressed understanding of reality uh, in the way that being actually is. So when I say that, like, you know, um, the law of identity, I think that's a fundamental law, though. I think that, like, something being itself and uh, that something must be itself, for example, um, or something cannot be itself and its contradiction is, um, you know, I think pretty like reasonable to 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 assume i think um i think they may like so for example with the law of um the law of non-contradiction there comes to a point where like in hegel for example he shows specific um you know specific areas in which we say something cannot be um both be itself and its contradiction but then says well absolutely it can because like being in nothingness can you know form becoming um, and then you have this combination in which the, the law of non-contradiction is no longer applicable to reality. And so why, you know, how do we hold on to that? And Hegel then kind of remedies this by saying um, a contradiction exists in mind, but not in nature. And so it's actually in our, um, you know, when he talks about like Frege and, and Frege and Russell's vagueness and them seeking to establish um, a formal logic, I think that they're doing something similar to Hegel but from a different standpoint. So what I would say is that there is a fittingness of the concept, that's a Heideggerian term, so that there is an accurate way of describing reality as it is, which corresponds, in which an identity, identity claim would correspond with the truth maker of that claim. So like, uh, P is actually P. And um, I think that's implicit in your application of language anyway, because otherwise there'd be like, no matter what form of, um, 
you know, like um, I think that one, it would it would lead to um, absurdism. Otherwise, um, in which case, like. I mean, shit, like, <laughs> like, you know, like all of this is uh, not, not only just uh, pointless, but I think that it's also a claim that cannot be instantiated in itself. It's a form of skepticism, like Fourierian skepticism, which usually becomes self-defeating, in which case, like, the um, you, you end up having, having to assume it's false in order to even assume that it was true. So, <laughs> um, so it, 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 cannot, it, it, it cannot function. But the, um, I think in, in terms of, uh, I think in terms of the, like, in terms of the, the whether P actually obtains, I think that, um, you know, whether it's even ancient philosophy, like, uh, I think Parmenides, I think, showed the undeniability of, of being to some degree, but in more, comp you know, more, like, sophisticated terms. I think someone like Robert Brandom's inferentialism, I think, shows that the, 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 the concept of language and the function of language as a form of not only communication, but of understanding and engaging with reality implies the possibility of the word or the signifier actually obtaining reality. And and I think that like that is like really it's a it's an attack on the Wittgensteinian point that language would function without that. You know, that language could function um in a way that was um non-correspondent to being. And um I absolutely reject that. I think that language and signification must um, signify something and that there is an implicit ass uh, assertion that language signifies a thing or an object or, or some form of being um which it may you know it may be false even every time almost every time but it must be it must possibly be true and so in some possible world there exists the truth of the actual uh, signifier um corresponding correctly uh with uh the object as in the concept and and I use concept in the Gitchian term you know, specific mental ability um, divests an aspect of reality from which is correctly understood and conferable to another agent in the form of a, of a word. And so when I say, um, you know, chair, uh, the concept which is actually divesting that aspect of reality and those parameters of reality are then communicable to you from which you will divest those same parameters and that same aspect of reality um, in the same way. So that would be the, the production of a, of a discrete object or determinate object. So a thing which is itself and not, and not something else. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure I followed all of that. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, uh, anything so, that like, obviously. So, so wait, wait, wait. So when I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure how the, this point about the connection of a word to something in the world uh, like chair I'm, I'm i'm a little bit confused about how that relates to the laws of logic i mean just because when i think about the laws of logic my i mean i i tend to think okay so when we talk about the laws of logic we might just be talking about the laws of some particular logical system and obviously there are you know you, you can you can construct any kind of logical system you want <clears throat> you know uh, that there are plenty of uh, you know classical logic, relevance logic, you know, modal logic, right? All of these different things. Um, so we we might just be talking about that, right? In, in which case, um, you know, you're just engaging in like abstract mathematics. Um, yeah. But what I I mean, what I'm assuming, you know, I'm I'm assuming that's not what we have in mind when we're talking about With the, the chair. Logic, no, no, right? no. I guess. So I guess. Like, I, okay. I, um, what? The, the, the way that I tend to interpret it, if philosophers talk about laws of logic, is the question is going to be, all right, but which of these systems, right? We've got all of these different systems. So let's take, say, classical logic versus relevance logic, right? In classical logic, um, you know, you've got the principle of explosion um, holds, uh, you know, from a contradiction, anything follows. That's not the case in relevance logic. Um, so one thing we can do when we look at these different systems is we can take them as kind of theories of correct reasoning or something like that. So we can suppose that there are certain uh, forms of inference, right, that actually are like truth preserving. Um, and then the conflict between classical logic and relevance logics and all these other systems can be viewed as uh, attempts, different attempts to describe truth, pres truth preserving forms of inference. Um, and so when I'm talking, so when I think about laws of logic, I'm just thinking about 
about like this, right? The, what are the truth preserving forms of inference? And I'm, I'm a little bit, conf so I, I guess, guess I'm a bit confused because, because then you started talking about, uh, I, I don't know, do you, do you see like the laws of logic as being what, like, like metaphysical, like part of the world or something like that? Because as I say, I, I'm thinking more just about like reasoning, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, the level at which I'm working. Part, I do see them as yeah. part of being, but okay. then I'm, I'm an idealist. So I take <laughs> being to be fundamentally yeah. comprised of thought. Okay. So like, um, uh, but like, as well spotted, but, uh, <laughs> Um, I guess like I'm, I'm happy to say that like in terms of the pure like abstract mathematical like you know signifiers um, that they like even if we were to say like like you know P being itself um, I would say like in terms of an analytic truth you know um, I would say that that was um, I'd say that one I think we'll have to assume it's the case for one I don't think that we can kind of get past it um, and then two I think that there's um, something I was actually going to say. So in terms of, oh yeah, in terms of like, um, you know, the, the the theory of of logic, you know, like as you say, whether it's like classical logic or like modal logic or so on, um, all of which assume, let's say, something like the law of identity. Um, and, and I'm yet to see like one that doesn't like, um, you know, propose at least some form of like identity, um, you know, like uh, something is itself, like for example. Um, that like P is P, um, unless I'm, am I, am I wrong there? I mean, you can oh. just, you can just make it up. Um, like nothing's, nothing's stopping you. I don't think you could do much with uh, a system in which like that didn't hold to some, in, in some respect, uh, like, um, but you know, you just, I, mean, I don't know if you could just make it up, man. Like, well, yeah, I mean, like, like, so you totally example, can just I'm, make up I'm, any, like, I mean, it, it's, it's so remember, I mean, like, I'm not saying that you can make up what forms of inference are actually truth preserving, right? But like, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure you, you can, you can just play like a, a kind of abstract game um, in which you like say, okay, here are the, here are the axioms of this system or here are the like forms of inference or, or something um, like, okay, here's a, here's a logical system, right? So um, right from, from P you can derive like just anything. Right, so uh, that's a particular. That's kind of a useless logical system, right? But um, yeah, you know, <laughs> there, there you go, <laughs> right? Um, okay, but that, I mean, but that, that's like nominal, isn't it's, it? Like, it's, 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 like... Not, it's not going to. I mean, yeah, like this. This is, as I say, this is just like a little game that you can play. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, uh, kind of. I mean, like, yeah, I think it's implied that there's an analytic truth, like, to, like, uh, to this. So, like, like, so if we say that you can produce, like, any logical system, like, what you really mean is that you can produce any combination of signifiers which don't correspond to, to any form of truth preserving uh, whatsoever. And then, then you've kind of got, like, you, you know, you've got, like, you know, incoherence. So you've got, like, gibberish or whatever, like, you know, you've got, like, a collection of symbols, right? But, like, in terms of, like, logic, I think there's, a, I don't know if I'm, I'm wrong in assuming this, but it seems that like truth preservation is essential. Um, at least like, like as, at least like, um, or at least, yeah, like, like, so like, you know, something like is, uh, like, I'm trying to think of how to, how to express this. I, I haven't been, I haven't been asleep yet. So I've been awake for like 20 hours. Um, the, <laughs> Like, so for example, like in terms of like, um, like classical logic and modal logic, both in both sets of like, um, like inference, um, there is the, there is analytic truth. Now I would have assumed until this conversation that all forms of logic required a level of at least analytic truth to them, an analytic truth preservation. Okay, I mean, I guess I don't know if I don't know if this even like like matters. I mean, it, it seems like maybe this is just a, like maybe you just don't want to call it call it a logical system or something like that. I mean, in which case, like, okay, fine, let it's, 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 not, right? it's yeah, like, like okay, look, you know, whatever, um, you know. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. So, the, like, uh, I, 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 I'm inclined to to think that yeah, you can you can play 
little logical games and construct systems um and you know have you can you can have like ridiculous rules of inference um in there you know you can you can say well from if like if a then b and b derive a right i mean nothing's stopping you from constructing a system with that particular rule uh it, it would just be kind of useless um but i don't i don't mm -hmm. know if, if anything I, would... I don't know if anything here really like hangs I guess, on this, I guess this agreement point, to be honest i mean it, it, this doesn't seem like like it's a particularly important point so maybe i should i just kind of grant this and say okay maybe like, i mean i guess i guess i just wanted to hear yeah yeah like yeah, especially when you said like the like so for when you say like axiomatically like in terms of like we could we could make a you know an assumption um and so on but like i guess in terms of logic like the way that i would ground logic in the first place would be that which cannot be denied whoa, 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 so wait, like wait. what do you mean gra why would you need to ground it i mean i'm not i'm not sure what you mean by that well not ground it i mean that's the grounding problem i mean like as in it's it's uh, I, I mean it would be necessity ne it would be by necessity so kind of like in the way that like aristotle would engage with it where it's like you simply cannot deny it let's move on um so i don't i don't think i can ground logic as in like going oh by the way like yeah i've proved the laws of logic sufficiently like absolutely not like that's not where i'm coming from no, yeah, um no, but what but i'm all, saying all is I'm, that... all, so all, all i'm saying so like we have um different logical systems anyway like we have logical systems that are look, incompatible um you know like classical logic and relevance logic are incompatible um now you, like the, the question is, okay, if, if you're then asking which of these um, correctly captures truth-preserving inferences, then it's like, th that's a philosophical problem. And that's something that, you know, we can have a debate about. But like, if, if you're just, like, I, I can just say, okay, I'm just going to do some relevance logic. And I might think that relevance logic uh, is, is not the right way of characterizing truth-preserving inferences, but you know, I can I can do it. Like I can just engage in the, um, you know, in in the in the little games, and I can make the derivations and so on. And I can it's just like a puzzle, right? And so I think that, yeah, I mean, you could you could have a logical system where where it's like from P you can just derive anything, right? And so again, that wouldn't be very interesting even as a game. But like I don't. I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have a problem calling it a, a logical so, system. Like, I guess I guess it's more of like um in terms of what logical system like or maybe I should just ask what logical system that you would use in order to um what would you be what would you accept in terms of argumentation? So like if obviously with terms of truth preservation, what logical system we accept is gonna be is going to be of, of relevance. At least to, I, I mean arguably not, actually. But then, <laughs> um uh but like I think that like in terms of like whether we we take uh, like say um, classical logic and whether the cl the laws of class like not, let's say the law of non contradiction holds true or not obviously determines whether if I you know were to if were to lead to a contradiction whether it would be like the case that it, it was uh, you know there was a flaw in the logic or not like or in the reasoning rather so. I guess, like, until we've kind of resolved this, I kind of don't know which way, which direction to even go. So <laughs> it's like, so for example, I, I usually just, I would probably assume, um, I go for like um, classical, like modal, or, or even modal logic, probably, um, a lot of the time, um, which I think is really similar to classical logic, to be entirely honest with you, um, like in terms of. Well, I would um, see modal logic as an extension of classical logic. And I mean, you can yeah. have, like, then you can, uh, because you're just introducing, like, new operators for yeah. you know, possibility right. and necessity. And you can, you can do that for, like, other you know, relevance logic as well. You can introduce new operators for that. Um, so I usually but, assume, like, that kind of direction, as you can see. Like, I'm normally, like, like my engagement with relevance logic is non-existent, like... I don't know any of the non-classical forms of logic really um, beyond the fact like so and so on. Normally when you hear like people deny the, the like so when you say like um, like in terms of problem solving that's fair enough but in terms of like argumentation mm. when you say P like you mean like so for example like if I say like uh, you know P is itself like kind of like law of identity or like you know P cannot be not P you know simultaneously 
uh, you know, like, you know, th these kinds of things. Like, would you agree with that? Or, like, is there a form oh, of okay. argumentation? Like, So, with with respect to the idea, like, a thing has to be itself, right? I mean, yeah, fine. I, I'm, if, 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 I'm, I'm happy to just accept that. I, I can't see any... That doesn't seem, like, coherent to me. I can't even imagine how that could fail to be the case. Um, so... That's like, what I thought, and that's where I ground these kind of, <laughs> Let's let's ground it. Although you know, when it comes to non-contradiction, I'm I'm perfectly happy with the idea of true contradictions. Uh, I, I, <laughs> but right. Um, I think that classical logic works fine in the vast majority of circumstances. Uh, I think that contradict true contradictions can arise from like. Um, there's a nice uh, way that I think it's. J.C. Beale puts it, he calls them spandrels of truth, that our languages have enough expressive power. Once you get a language which has enough expressive power to create self-referential sentences and it has a truth predicate, then you're just going to unavoidably get things like the liar sentence. Um, and obviously there are lots of different ways of responding to the liar sentence, but People I was going to say I'm, I'm, I was going to I was going to respond to that like in terms of a Lacanian like the the point of like uh, it's true at it's uh, was it it's uh, it's false was it true at the point of enunciation but false at the point of uh, I can't remember the exact terminology but yeah continue um, but yeah I mean so yeah lots of responses but um, those those of us who are inclined towards dialetheism, the view that there are true contradictions, will say, okay, none of these really work, and we should just accept, yeah, there are some true contradictions. Um, and then all, all we have to do is, um, like, adjust. It's like, okay, well, that means we have to adjust what we thought the laws of logic were, um, you know, and uh, we can carry on using classical logic in every other context. Um, it's just there are these... What would you give as an example of a true contradiction, for example? Well, like you know, the liar sentence is the uh, is is the classic one. So, like, but like, I, okay, just to like, also be clear, right? I I don't just, uh, none of this is important as far as I'm concerned. Like, I don't see this as so. There are some there are some philosophers who take all of this like really seriously, and it really matters to them. I I don't I don't like I'm not actually that bothered, right? Like, if you want to say there are no true contradictions, I'm totally happy to grant that for the purposes of this argument because honestly, I I have nothing like. Uh, kind of writing right. on this. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Like, we'll just walk past it because I think that we're going to end up just staying on like on logic for the rest of the whole for the rest of the conversation. Um, just just because like I, I think like I think that Lacan does actually uh, respond to that quite well because when he says like with the what, where, how how would you um how do you put the liar paradox? Okay, it's, well, um, uh, yeah, this sentence is false, but the, 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 there are there are other yeah. versions of liar type paradoxes um, where. Uh, I think you're probably going to find that kind of response a little bit difficult to maintain. Yeah, yeah like th that's the thing because that's not the only because um, I've seen multiple kinds of the liar paradox. Um, it's like, um, was it like this? This uh, this sentence is false, but then there's like this sentence is false or meaningless. Mm. Um, mm. I think it is. Um, but like, I think I, I do think that Lacan actually gets past that because he basically says that like uh, there is a separation in when you're saying the sentence between the agent and what they're saying, and so the individual that says that this sentence is false is um or like um or like um yeah was well, it this sentence is false um or meaningless um it can be both um. Uh, it can it can be separate from the actual expression. So, like for example, um, an individual who says a sen sentence um, can try and express something in reality from which they themselves are not expressing, and the sentence can mean separate to what it's uh, what they believe it's signifying in Lacan. Mm. So that that's kind of like how he over who, uh, um, kind of um, like overcomes it. But that's psychoanalytic, I suppose, and it's just a dodgy well, way out. Isn't I, it? I just well, just, <laughs> just a quick suggestion. Um, there are forms of the lie paradox which involve like two people. So you can say like you've got uh, Frank and Vincent, and then Frank says what Vincent yeah, what Vincent says at time t one is false, and then Vincent's like what Frank says at time you know t zero is false, and you end up getting uh, you end up getting the same problem, um, but it's no longer like just one person. 
saying it. So I, I'm not sure that that kind of response would work in that case. But I mean, there's lots of. I'll, I'll, I will. I will do my best to go through every single one of them. And I swear to God, after this, I'll just I'll just spend myself hours going through. But yeah, okay, like well, well um, I'm assuming that this sentence is uh, is not false, and we'll just <laughs> just continue. Um, so right. We've got logic. <laughs> we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna just say we've got logic, right? And, well, like, actually, um, so sorry. Before you, you continue, um, I mean, I, I, I think that I was sort of a while back, kind of in the process of just trying to clarify exactly what you mean here, um, because as I say, when when I was thinking about like laws of logic, I was thinking laws of reasoning. Whereas for you, it's what you had in mind was, was this kind of metaphysical, these sort of metaphysical fundamentals, um, or, or it's like like an an object must be itself, right, or something like that. Yeah, kind of like yeah, like like. But even in terms of reasoning, like the ability to like uh, like so, for example, I think in, in terms of a metaphysical, um, you know, in terms of Aristotle, even like um, it doesn't matter where you start; it matters, you know, uh, where you end. So as long as your your reasoning is 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 uh, sound, then you know we can build inferences and come to uh, better our signification, which is essentially what Hegel's saying when he even says that the laws of logic themselves progress, which is why he's saying that you know there can be contradictions, but then we can like go on and like express where these contradictions lie and why they lie in these situations and ex and and analyze the. The, the language from which we're using and I think that this is where a lot of where issues lie so I, I would I would say that like from this position um I would start that like you know you, you've got being at least in some form um Hegel starts with being and nothingness you know like essentially being and it's and it's um and it's uh, negation um which I think is basically just logic uh metaphysically instantiated. Um, um, so I, I I don't really I don't know Hegel at all. Um, but uh, okay, when you say you, you've got um, being and nothingness, um, I, I, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm being really pedantic here, but um, don't worry. I, 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 I worry I worry about this because it kind of sounds like we might be reifying nothingness and like treating it as as a thing, which it isn't. So I I don't know if it would be the negation of the thing. Right. Um, so so like so for example. Um, so, for example, I, I would, I would, I would agree with you that we can't treat nothingness as a thing, and, and, and even in a paramedi like paramedian sense, um, you know, when he says, um, "From that which you cannot think, you cannot know, and you cannot think," um, um, like th that, that's essentially what I would say. Nothingness is absolutely. Um, in Hegel, it's it, it it would refer to an absence. Which is an understood, like it's understandable. It's it's something which can be understood as the absence of a thing. So if you think about it in terms of like, do you know Sartre? Um, sort of vaguely. I'm I'm not. I, do I don't I don't know much about... continental philosophy in general, right? So uh, no, like no, yeah. no, 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 that's that's fine. Like honestly, half of the stuff that you've said, I, I'm very sketchy on. So like, <laughs> it's uh, this is the issue. Like I, I spend all my time in continental philosophy. And you probably spend most of your time in analytic philosophy, right. <laughs> and you know, so uh, you know, we're going to get we're gonna, we'll get through this somehow. Don't worry. Um, uh, you know, we'll just cross borders. Um, you know. Uh, anyway, so the idea is that um, <clears throat> you know, you 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 go into a cafe, and every day you go into the cafe. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, so I think we'll just call him Jean. <laughs> Jean is stood like, sat in the same place every day in the cafe. Um, and you know, one day you walk into the cafe, and uh, Jean is not there. And basically, what he's saying is that in that moment, you gain knowledge from the absence of a thing from which you were anticipating. So, like the being from which you understood, like you know, the cafe includes John, no longer includes John, and so you've gained knowledge that it's separate from him, and it gives you an indication of like reality, you know, as being uh, non-inclusive of that object. So, if like if I were to say like. Um, I don't know, like, uh, like you know, all swans are white, um, you know, and I come across a black swan, then I've came across like something, which is um, nullified that sense. But if I if I was to say that, um, um, you know, that there must always be, um, 
I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good example actually now that I've I've gave this uh, kind of point of negation. I, I'm actually struggling to instantiate it beyond a cafe. Um, like um, all houses have doors, hmm. and then I, I go into a house and it hasn't got doors. I'd be like, well, wait a minute. Okay, clearly not all houses have doors, right? You know, I've gained knowledge about what a house is in relation to the negation of of um, a determinate object in that sense, okay. and that, that would be like in its in its in its ultimacy. That is nothingness um, for for Hegel. Um, he would say that like um, you have being, which that which is, and nothingness, which is that which isn't. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, and um, in combination we can gain knowledge. But in but he takes being in its infinite in its as as an infinite. So he thinks that. Um, I'm going to use a lot of continental l lingo here and you're going to hate this. Um, <laughs> so you come from the point of like totality. So that would be um, if you. So from in the dialectic, if we were to try and understand reality. We would be met with, um, you know, like all of our let's 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 say, like, I mean, you met with everything at once pretty much and in like the infinite experience excuse me there would be nothing like demarcating one object from another nothing that would would give you the ability to differentiate one object from another because there'll be no concept or specific mental ability which would allow you to go this that um you know and then and like obviously okay. name, so, so, sorry, uh, just, give them um, to reality can i just i i feel like i might have missed something you've said here and maybe it was because there was like a noise in the background just a minute ago so oh, did you say that if you try to i thought you said if you try to understand being in its totality then there'd be no way of demarcating one thing from another was, was that the claim yeah it'd be infinite it'd be like an infinite so it'd be like you, you'd be saying like as in not like being in its totality but rather that totality is um and uh, like what well, actually what he would refer to as like this is actually Levinasian term totality so just I'll, I'll leave that out so what he describes as imminent being or like immediate this is just like like what you uh, experience itself like pure um unconditioned experience would be the best way to put it okay so we're talking about like experience without any conceptualization of you know yes. the, the, the objects okay yeah yeah right I'm, and I'm he would you. say there would be nothing differentiating determinate objects within that experience. Okay. Um, and so the combination of being and nothingness is how we uh, differentiate objects. So uh, an object is something which not only is definable as itself, but also holds the definition of not being something else. Right. So like, this is a chair are not a table um or this is like otherwise it would be yeah like otherwise there wouldn't be like demarcated lines between okay being. okay i think i think i'm i think i'm following this um so so is it, it i mean i i don't know i'm just gonna use a different example here um from 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 science um so if i was to try to you know do some sort of like if I was to have a theory, right, derive a prediction, and like let's say the prediction is that the temperature of this like tube of gas is going to be twenty degrees, and I measure it and it's fifteen degrees, then well I'm thinking okay that that disconfirms the theory, but of course it only disconfirms the theory, right, if you can make the additional assumption that anything that's fifteen degrees is not twenty degrees. Um, like yes. there has to be. A kind of there's a, there's a sort of ontological principle here where we're assuming that there's like a a single value to certain things that we can measure or that that, that properties or maybe objects or whatever um like the, the existence of something ex excludes i don't know how to put this excludes it so like for example it must be itself and not something else. so he says um it must hold the property of of not being um not being 
so it was like okay, but, so, but, ob so like object A must hold the properties of being object A, but also hold the property of not being object B. Okay, so here's I think where I'm I'm a, uh, I'm getting a bit stuck because like if I think about you know the cup in front of me, right? It's like mm -hmm. yeah, this cup kind of excludes certain properties in the sense that um, all right, it's got a particular shape, which means because it has this shape, it can't have any other shape. Um, but then how do, I mean, so how, how are we getting to the conclude? So how do we know then what, what it is, what properties it is that the cup excludes? Because the fact that the surface has a particular shape is entirely compatible with the surface, say, having a particular color. Um, and in the case of color, uh, like, okay, it's got a red color, which I guess maybe you'd say, well, that excludes it having a green color. But then that's not, I don't know, that's not actually obvious to me. Um, you mean where do the lines, like, are the, where well, are the lines drawn? Yeah, so like when I think about, what, so when I, I think about shape, I can... become a hill, you know, that kind of... I, I can see that the shape of the cup in front of me, right, it's like that's, that excludes it having some other type of shape, right? Um, whereas the colour, um, so it's, let's say, red all over, right? Could it be red all over and green all over? In that case, I'm I'm not so sure. Um, like, I've, I, I mean, intuitively, I guess it couldn't be. But then, you know, colours can be strange, and there are certain circumstances where it seems like maybe things, or at least at least perceptually, can do that. Um, I and so it's like, can, can, like red and green all over. Yeah, there are like uh, um, it's still like teal in terms of like blue and green. No, I mean, um, I, I mean, both separate colors, like obtaining at once in the same perceptual experience. Like, uh, I've even in terms of like your eye, you could have the so activation. I've, of I've, like... I've done this. So um, there is actually like some some research uh, where they put people in special. Um, I don't know what it was. I don't know what methods they used, but they did like eye tracking things and they created a situation where people reported seeing something that's red all over and green all over. But if you just like have red and green and then like cross your eyes i mean i'm not sure what my experience is i'm not sure how to describe it when i when i do that but like it it seems like it might just be naturally described as red all over and green all over um like i'm not sure right but, but this is what i mean when i say you know so this is why i'm i'm i'm, I'm not See, Quite this isn't how... necessarily against Hegel anyway, because like right, basically okay. he says that like so like so let's say you propose like a thesis of being, yeah, um, and then obviously you 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 met almost instantaneously with an antithesis of that position, uh, where it's like yes, but it doesn't include x parameters from which um, indicates that this thesis is incorrect, um, and then he says at that point you end up in where it takes the dialectical process of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, um, new hypothesis of reality, um, establishing like, uh, like a, a progressive movement of analysis. Right. I'm not, so I'm... like where you'd go like, this is like red and green all over. Yeah. You then go like, well, no, it, it appears green. So it'd be like, uh, it appears red, it appears green. The synthesis may be, it is both red and green. Yeah. Okay. And that wouldn't be a problem for Hegel. I mean, no, I, I, I wasn't uh, trying to present this e even as an objection. It was just with, um, you know, the, it, it seemed like the, the point is that when we perceive certain objects as having certain properties, we're kind of simultaneously perceiving the exclusion of certain other properties. And, um, you know, I was just trying to get my head around that. Idea. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. Like, no, and I completely understand that. And I think, I think, like, it has to to some degree. But I think that the whole point of like, I think Hegel's very almost online with the whole Aristotelian point where it doesn't matter where you start. In the sense that, like, you will come from an intuitional understanding of reality and demarcate those lines in terms to the well, I would say by language. So, like, this is like almost a form of linguistic relativity, which is like kind of built into the uh, the fact that we're subjects engaged in a language game. Mm -hmm. Um, 
when we try to like actually like divest reality itself, the signifier is actually always separate from reality and so never truly fully corresponds to reality in a way that you know p actually fully obtains p um and so like in terms of a thesis about reality i mean or even about a single being um and this is where it's like a point of constant analysis uh in which we we use reason and i don't think that necessarily but then the, I think the important thing like to remember in this is that there is a reality for like in terms of Hegel, there is a reality which can be known, um, like a, a knowable reality which is being investigated through the use of reason. Okay. Um and so there is a this is where Heidegger says there is a fittingness of, to the concept. So if the concept in a in a Gitchian term is a specific mental ability, um and then an idea and 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 um I think is it an idea is a concept expressible through language. So if I have the idea of a chair, I can express that through language. That idea exists as a now as a um, as a word, and a word is a what I would say is a is an objectified concept, a concept which exists separate from my interpretation of its usage in a Wittgensteinian sense. Um, obviously, it's still in the subjective. Ultimately, it's not like objective in the sense that it it exists between agents, mm -hmm. but it's 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 separate from a subject. And I would say that that is fundamentally where um, our divestations of reality occur. Like metaphysics um, demands of us that we, or, or sorry, uh, like um, knowledge is only possible um, in the sense that is non-private. Our our investigation of reality is is purely non-private. And that's actually really important for what I'm going to say. So, do you agree with that? Um. Uh. Yeah, I think I'd I'd be I'd be happy to. I yeah. I think that. So. Where where I. I don't know. I I think I I'd be happy to to just yeah grant that. Um. I, so I should say that where I have. I guess trouble with um, these arguments about like you know la language and the need for it to be fundamentally public is that it I always get the impression that there are there are some very deep like skeptical problems about the nature of meaning which arise for the idea of any kind of concept or idea that's like purely private but I'm never really sure how going public actually helps, um, but I don't know if I if maybe I can just put that aside for the purpose. No, no. Of this. I mean, like, I mean, if you want to talk about that, that's fair enough. Because I mean, meaning, for example, like the Hegelian mode of ethics is like struggling against the meaninglessness of existence, which is why he talks about the French Revolution as you know, um, a death signify with no significance greater than cutting the head off a cabbage. It's metaphysical, like he genuinely means, like meaning itself in terms of ethics has been lost at a point in which the 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 language game has broken down. Um, okay, I, I feel like itself, you maybe, um, so, so I feel like we were maybe using the term meaning in a more kind of substantial. I'm, I'm just talking about like the meaning of words. I was just thinking about like like language, you know. Um, but they, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, but I mean, like, no, no, I mean, like, they, they, they're tied in for Hegel. So, like, um, like the meaning of like our understanding of reality and the meaning of one's life. It's not that like, so when I say like the meaning of one's life, if you were to say like that, and we normally refer to that in some of in like you know purpose or telos, like you know the end of the the the, the purpose of one's being, mm -hmm. that would only be understandable via the meaning of words from which exist in a language game and an institution for Hegel and so if our ethical institutions fall apart our language falls apart the very meaning from which we gain our purpose in life falls apart so like he genuinely sees it like as it, like Hegel literally takes it from metaphysics like you cannot drop a, a single step in Hegel because he will literally like his whole thing is like flow as a dialect otherwise it's pointless okay, um, so so if if by if when we're talking about meaning we're talking about like say the meaning in life or the purpose in life i mean i I'd, I'd be inclined to just reject that there is any such thing um so i mean i certainly wouldn't be prepared to grant 
that for any kind of argumentative purpose. Oh, that's, uh, that's fine. That's, that's, that's fine. A, that's no, 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 that's point. fine. That would, would, that, that's, what, that's the point of contention. If, yeah. if we're talking about like just, okay, the meaning of the word chair, let's say, um, kind of has to be public, right? Um, like uh, there can't be a private mm -hmm. language, right? If this is the, if, if this is all that's in contention at this point, I think at yeah, this point, yes, yeah. we could just yeah, grant that and, and move on. Cool. Even though I, like, I don't know, maybe it'll come <laughs> up again because I, I, as it's I say, come up again. there are, are sceptical problems with the idea of a public language, right? Like I don't, I, 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 I think it's like uh, it's one of these issues where I, I don't know what to say about it, and I don't have any clear opinion. I just think that um, attempting to explain, like, in virtue of what does the word chair designate a particular concept um even if you're talking about a public language i i i have no i have no idea and um i think there's a really deep skeptical problem there um but as i say i think, it, I think Wittgenstein would just literally just point at the usage he'd be like he'd be like look people use this concept in line with a certain like purpose and relate it to like other inferences which are like caught in a loop in a language game which are kind of tied together but the usage um, doesn't um so usage is is like yeah fine right there is a past usage of a particular word but like let's say um okay let's just say the word chair right and uh, we can say um that so far right people have used the word chair to designate particular items in the world now suppose that you know i like come upon some new area where I've never been before. And, you know, I see something with like four legs and, you know, it's, it's like flat. Let's say this is, uh, I don't know, beside Mount Everest, right? So, and it, you know, we, and I look at it, I say, oh, that's a chair. And then somebody says, um, no, it's not a chair. And in fact, uh, the way that you've been using the word chair all along, indeed the way all of us have been using the word chair all along, um, is that a chair is, you know, anything that looks like this, except it's not within, you know, 500 meters of Mount Everest. Um, I mean, obviously, that's that's completely crazy, right? But what fact can we point to um, that makes that not the case, right? What, what fact can we point to to show that actually, uh, when we were using the word chair, we meant like chair, right? Rather than uh, chair, unless it's within 500 meters of Mount Everest, right? How do we rule out um, these like deviant interpretations of our concepts, and I, d I don't know how to do that. I I like I, I have no. I, I don't know. I, I well, have this, I have no I idea. Think, so I think, I think I think Wittgenstein would literally just say, "You're at a point of contention where you're saying that you're saying chair, and they're saying not chair, and this is the language game from which we're playing, and there is like they're either playing a separate game to you in which the concept that they're using is." something which is um which exists in a separate game played by other participants from which they've always meant a specific set of criteria which is you know um non-applicable to this circumstance so it's it, you wouldn't be wrong in saying chair for for wittgenstein um well, i mean this like so this this problem kind of comes from from wittgenstein or maybe not it comes from maybe how people have interpreted Wittgenstein. Um, but like, it's, it's, you know, Wittgenstein has um, that point about, you know, when somebody um, is, you ask somebody to add by two, right? And so you say, okay, two, four, six, eight, blah, 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 right? And then they get to uh, a thousand, right? And somebody's, somebody's doing the whole like, okay, 996, 998, 1000, 1004. 1008 and you're like whoa 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 wait a minute um i said add by two right yeah th that's like I've, I've given you the rule right you've got to add by two and the person it says uh no i'm i am following the rule right i like that is the rule um that is the add by two rule uh now i think wittgenstein does want to get around this by appealing yeah. to public language but i <laughs> I'm I'm just not sure how that does. I don't know how that helps. I mean, like, why would the fact that everybody happens to be using a term in a particular like so, you know, because obviously even even as a like uh, public uh, 
collection of people, right? You, you often encounter like new things. You have to um, extend the rule into new domains, right? So what mm -hmm. fact about that collection of people makes it the case that the way to extend the rule is, you know, is this rather than this, rather than some weird deviant interpretation? Like, I totally agree that, you know, there, that there are these problems with a private language. I'm just not sure how going public uh, actually solves those, those, those problems. I, I feel like exactly the same. I think, same I think it solves, of I think it solves one of the problems. I think, you're, I think you're right in saying like, so for example, if you were to, and I, and I think that this is kind of included in Hegel really, because it's like, um, if you like, so for example, in terms of, it seems like you've, you've moved from one mind to mind itself, where it's like, right, yeah, but this is a problem within our language now. It's like, we've all, we've all had this bias. We didn't know it. Um, and then obviously then we'll kind of go on and, and it, it so happens to function. But then if we hit a point where like 50% of society says one thing and 50% of society says another, or even two people are, are one person, you know, in terms of the interpretation of the rule, um, like what was actually holding it constant between the multiple agents, because it's like, it's purely phenomenal. You know, it's purely like, um, it's purely like, um, it's being held by something from which requires subjective application to see whether it was being used in the in the first place. As in, someone comes over, verifies, and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely using the rule right, you know. And 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 I think you're absolutely right in that. Like, but I think this is where, like, for example, I would point to the function of the rule. Um, and um, so I'd say, like, so for example, um, when we're riding by two, what was the purpose of the of of that um? of that task mm. what was the purpose and then i would and then I'll, that's where i would say the fittingness of the concept lies so when it's like analyzing whether it was fit to purpose okay so then we'd have to what specify what the purposes are for like all of the different terms and so on of our language um mm -hmm. i mean I, I'm, I'm inclined to think that there just aren't any uh, purposes in that sense I think well, I think that like obviously de demarcating lines between determinate objects, for example, I, I think I think that the way in which we engage with life is purposeful in the sense that we um, that it's intentional. That so, like that like so. For example, the next thing I was going to ask you is, do you agree that we have like desire? And by desire, I mean like an action urging process. Um, you know, uh, in which we attempt to obtain okay, yeah. like a given end. So I, th I think so. Just like with, with with respect to this language point, maybe we should just move on because, like, I mean, I I do, I do no. I mean, I, obviously, I, I use language. I think words have meanings, right? But I I'm troubled by this skeptical problem, and I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but um, I'm not sure it really matters because I'm kind of happy just to grant, and I do grant that words have meanings, right? So uh, I don't know whether it might be worth just. Uh, like taking that as a shared yeah i mean for these, for these purposes i guess i guess um, i mean like unless you got unless you're at the end of the like you know thank you for the meaningless conversation I, no you I'm know not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, um okay um yeah so okay yeah what, so, so so what what was the what was the next thing uh like so i mean like in, just in terms of the private like obviously the private like kind of public thing just to exemplify cause someone in the chat just said you have to go frege geach obviously the kind of frege geach embedding problem you know the ability to like hold the uh the like you know the the argumentation set that is is like you know um you know essentially the the, the argumentation um um like in inferentially um it requires the existence of like uh, of of a application of a concept separate to the interpretation of that application at least on a like subjective level so you can go like there is like a set version of parameters from which i can investigate whether i'm actually talking about the thing from which i think i'm talking about in order to gain some level of truth value otherwise it wouldn't like obviously inference wouldn't function i'm a bit i'm oh, sorry i'm a bit confused about what the frege geach problem has to do with this well because like like in terms of the um because like in, like so for example in the frege geach problem it's like um it, it's obviously the the re referencing 
um, subjectivism, right? Like in terms of that, most subjectivism are actually referencing that non-cognitivism, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's saying like, if you're trying to build up something which is, and, and I think the whole point about the Frege Gitch problem is the fact of the private uh, experience of an individual um, being as in the, as in the, uh, maybe I'm wrong in this, but as in the, the experience of an individual is, um, in, is one with the interpretation of that experience. So we could not know whether we're interpreting our experiences um, the same in each, uh, or even like, or, or, or like the proposed metaphysical like truth maker, the same in each case. So whether the like when I say bad and bad in the in two separate you know premises, whether I'm actually saying the same thing. Um, that's not how I would interpret the Frege Gitch problem. Um, okay. So, I mean, my, so my, my interpretation of it is that. Uh, the point is, you know, if you adopt a non-cognitivist view, if you hold the view, for instance, that uh, moral claims are just expressions of emotional attitudes or something like that, then, um, like, when somebody says, okay, abortion is wrong, um, they're expressing something like, boo to abortion. Um, but the problem is, obviously, we can embed that in larger sentences, like, if abortion is wrong, then paying somebody to get an abortion is wrong, or I wonder whether abortion is wrong. And in none of those sentences are we expressing an attitude. Like, if I say, I wonder whether abortion is wrong, I'm not expressing the attitude, uh, boo to abortion. Because, I mean, hey, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm wondering. Um, and like, you know, if abortion is wrong, paying somebody to get an abortion is wrong. Again, uh, I'm, that's just like, I'm hypothetically considering it. Um, and then that leads to like problems with, uh, 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 kind of constructing arguments, showing that they can preserve truth um because the original sentence is not going to be truth valuable at all um i i don't think that it it's about like the fact that we what was it like the the word like the word good or the word bad or wrong um is somehow connected to private experiences um I mean, I think actually most, so if you look at the original, like, emotivists, uh, they wouldn't have said that those words were connected to private experiences because they, like, Ayo was a behaviorist. So, you know, um, yeah, sure, I mean, yeah. abortion, abortion is wrong, expresses uh, a negative emotional attitude to abortion, but then uh, negative emotional attitudes, I think for Ayo would be explained in terms of observable behavior um, rather than in terms of, like, in private internal states. Um, although, you know, I, I, might, I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty, I mean, he was a verificationist, certainly. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, um, that, that's the, so, so I'm, I'm, I don't know if I necessarily see the connection, um, to... Well, I guess, cause like, cause like, normally when I, like, when I, when I'm, oh, sorry, God. Um, so like the one that I usually, uh, think about when in terms of the embedding problem is, um, you know, like... Like, as you say, like, if Tom and the cat is bad, you get your little, little brother to do it as bad, Tom and the cat is bad, or go letting your little brother um, Tom and the cat is bad. And in each one of those cases, it's whether the um, whether the inference actually holds in terms of, like, so, like, if Tom and the cat is, like, you know, boo, then getting your little brother to do it is, you know, like, boo. Uh, you know, like, it, and, and, and I think that, like, obviously you can like in terms of i guess maybe i'm going a little bit more towards the cognitive side of things where i'm saying that like uh, i guess i would argue that like something like boo was a private state of being and then obviously your ability to hold that constant within an inference but maybe that maybe I've misinterpreted the Frege Gitch problem there, and I'll, I'll go back and I'll reread it, and maybe I've um, like I, I, I would, I, I, so, applied something to it. But why would you be assuming that like boo is a private state of being when if if we take it to be an expression of like attitude, then I mean surely um, yeah we we have a kind of public language for describing individual attitudes, right? Like. Um, so it, it sort of seems like you're kind of saddling the, the non-cognitivist with um, you know, a position that's much more controversial than they really need to hold. Uh, like they, I don't see why the, why they would be committed to thinking gonna, yeah. that like um, um, that the, the boo has to be private. Well, I think the one I, I would reject behaviorism. So 
like um I don't think that behaviorism actually um I I, I, I wouldn't say that it like I I like one I don't think it's been instantiated mm. um and unless you disagree with this do do are you a behaviorist or no I, no I'm 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 fine with this this is I I'm okay, not a behaviorist okay. Okay. Um, I just like every step of the way. It's like, do, 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 do you disagree with me? Do you agree with me? Okay. Like, um, so in this, I would say that like the into even in terms of like so when you talk about like emotional expression. Mm -hmm. So it's like let's say like um, in terms of like taste or something like that. I would say that the whether like the like the the state of like the expression, um, <clears throat> like. The expression, I don't think I have a necessary like issue with, if it's like purely like um, like um, because I mean this is this I mean like one, there's a separation between um, like I guess it's the prescriptive claim in relation to like inference. So it's like if you like so like for example, let's take like something like norm expressivism or something like that. I don't know, um, or like as as you said, like quasi quasi realism, like talking as if morals are real. Um, like, you know, like if you like chocolate cake, like I like chocolate cake and I, let's say you can reference the expression of like the, like you, you eat chocolate cake and it lets you express the like, yeah, yeah for chocolate cake. Right. So I like chocolate cake. And then like premise, like two would be, um, premise two would be the, like, um, like, uh, I, like, you know, if I want, or like, it would be like, even if I like. I don't know whether I should say if I want, but you can you can pull up if if you got a problem with the language I use, let us know. So like I I, I think want I don't, um, yeah I'm getting at so yeah yeah so I, I want to have a pleasurable experience um uh and then you like you know like like two like uh like I mean like conclusion like essentially I should do chocolate cake um now I guess what I would say in that scenario well one. Um, actually, like the pleasurable experience. One second, I probably worded it in a way that I'll reject it outright. So one second, <laughs> um, one second. So I'll just write it out a little bit. I'm struggling, I think. I haven't been asleep yet. Um, press one. Um. um So, um, and then the next one be like, uh, uh, um, Okay, so like the first, the first one would be like, yeah, for chocolate cake, yeah means I like something. Um, I like chocolate cake, right? Um, and I think like that is that like so. For example, I would have a point of um, contention in the sense that like I wouldn't necessarily say yeah equals I like something. As in having the co as in I would challenge the non cognitivist at saying why why they can equival equivocate yeah and the cognitive cognitive attitude of liking. Okay. Okay. But does that? I mean, the, I mean, obviously, like the the the, the yay is just a kind of sort of placeholder in a in a sense. I, so maybe. Yeah, as in like as a as an a state of approval. Yeah. So 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 okay. Like, okay. That I, I I get it. Right. So the, the, there's a, there's a distinction between a state of approval and so uh, Frank is in a state of approval towards X and Frank likes X. Um, is, mm -hmm. is that, yeah. Okay. Okay. I I think. And I think the, the separation. I, I think I, I, think, I, I, think, I, I think I agree actually. 
Um, but I'm not sure why this would be necessarily a problem for a non-cognitivist. Like, so do I mean? Do you agree More that of a people problem for a prescriptive like so for or even a so it, sorry can actually continue? So I was just going to say. So do you agree that people can be in like a state of approval and a state of disapproval, and that people have like say emotional reactions to things? Um, I mean, um, yeah, correct. like so, as in like hundred degree emotions. No, I, I, I mean, just like I mean, so are you prepared to say that you know Frank is happy and you know, Frank? Is I'm angry, not going to reject. Right? I'm not going to say like yeah. I'm not going to reject like yeah, uh, uh, like, a, like. And, and yeah. so, if if on if there's a, a, an emotivist analysis where we're saying okay, moral moral claims just express emotions, right? Um, I mean, it doesn't seem like it needs to be any more sophisticated than just, all right, people have emotions. I mean, you, you can certainly dispute the claim about the meaning of moral statements, right? There are all kinds of problems with emotivism as an analysis of the meaning of moral statements. But I don't think that the, the problem has anything to do with the way in which, like, um, certain states are private or the way in which, say, um, my reports of what I like might diverge from um, my emotional states. If, if you see what I mean, like I, I think emotivism can just be given on like once we've got the emotions, then you, you can, yeah, like that's that's enough for them. See, I don't know because like they, like so for example, in the terms of like the emotivist, like the expressivist, like as well, specifically like the quasi realist or the or the norm expressivist. Okay. Um, I think that the real issue arises for them one because it's prescriptive. Um, so they're holding themselves as in they have a form of self knowledge. What I'm rejecting is that there is any such thing as inherent self-knowledge. And so any state of approval can give knowledge of oneself without having an argument which justifies a theory of um a theory of self, as in like why you are like like this. And so you need some form of like um, you know, uh like rec like, I'm, I'm gonna argue for like psychological recognition in a second, but like in terms of like your ability to understand what you are and what you let's say like, dislike you know, approve of, um, like, I mean, approve and disapprove at a fundamental level, like, um, you know, uh, express positive, um, you know, express negative. That's fair enough. But the, like, and I think kind of fundamental for any language to form. So I'm not really going to reject that. Right. Like, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'll be an absolute, like, um, I'll be in an absolute pit if I did. Yeah, that would be so, as bad as rejecting the laws of logic, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you know, yeah. Um, you said it. I didn't. I didn't say it. No, but I, you know, like, uh, I think it would be, um, you know, like I, I swear to God, normal people must like look at these discussions and just think, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you know, <laughs> like, um, okay. So, um, yeah, I agree with approval and disapproval. However, I don't think approval and disapproval can give self knowledge. And so, when you say I like. Um, I think that in moving it from the non-cognitive to the cognitive, um, as in a as in a meaningful form of expression, um, is an issue. Now, it's only an issue if you need it to be. You know, if the person's wanting it to be. If the person's just saying like it's not, it's not I mean, a meaningful form of expression. What are you talking about? Like, you, you know what I mean? You just you approve, you disapprove. You know, you're the anti. You, I mean, you seem like the anti-realist who wouldn't have a problem with that uh, necessarily. Um, when I so was a maybe a point. I was not a quasi realist. Um, I always saw it as a kind of tranquilization of the position, which annoyed me deeply. So yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, you know, people want that cake and uh, you know want to have that cake and eat it too. But I guess that's not really a problem for your position. <laughs> so you know. Uh, <laughs> okay. So. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think like so like that's kind of where I would take like where I would have normally related the embedding problem to in the sense that um, I would have said that the reason that it doesn't fit in those scenarios is primarily because the inference is not like the, the concept is able to change. Um, uh, like a non-cognitive statement cannot fit a cognitive, um, it cannot fit into a cognitive framework, um, at least not without like a theory of like self-knowledge. So like, you, like so to say that you actually like something is to say actually um, they're, they're, because of these reasons, uh, even if it references those states of approval as truth makers, um, it's making a universal claim about oneself. So like saying like, um, um, every time you eat chocolate cake, you have given approval 
um, by approval, um, we see that it's a positive experience. Positive experience like denotes the concept of liking, which is a cognitive like uh, a cognitive state. And then they then we kind of build it up from there. Do you see what I mean? But um, it's it's a form of self knowledge in which you have to yeah. investigate oneself and like then like actually just oh yeah I like it. So I okay I think I think I, I I get you. I'm just a bit. I, I'm not sure where the problem is for the for the non cognitivists to be honest. Like I, um, it's a problem. I mean so, that's that's a problem. Like I mean I think even for the non cognitivists the the, the Geech embedding problem is only a problem in the sense like I mean it's a problem in the sense that like uh, if you're I trying mean, to express I'm, a meaningful. So with respect to the the embedding problem, I, I still that's not really how I've always understood it. Um, yeah, that's fair enough. I might have I might have misunderstood it. Like to be fair, I but th this like uh, argument that you've raised. I mean, okay, you know that's that's like hey, I mean if that's a problem, then that's that's in, that's an interesting point. I'm just um, like okay, so what? What I mean, in fact, maybe I'll put it this way: Why would I even need any self knowledge at all to? Um, endorse a non-cognitivist position. I could just be talking about other people. And in fact, that's what, uh, like if you're giving an analysis of the meaning of moral statements, and if we assume that, okay, language is public, then like, that's really what you're looking at is like, hey, other people, how are they using these terms, right? What do they mean? I don't really have to think about myself at all, do I? Um, well, I think you do. I think it depends on like, so for example, if you're using like a moral, um, so like, Okay, so like to say like something is like um, kind of, I mean, like we're going to have to get on to like actually what morality is and like obviously argue for or against like non-cognitivism or so on. Like, are you going to have to argue against my form of realism um, and see whether that leads you to like a form of non-cognitivism or something? So what I'm going to say is that we are all action urging. We're all in, in, uh, engaged in an action urging process. We have desire. Do you agree with that? 